Uh, hi, I'm Evan Woolley, the captain of Double Jeopardy. And I'm Bryce Woolley. I fire the cannon. And you're listening to the Robocast. Hello everyone, welcome back to the Robocast with myself, SamElit64, Steve the American Killjoy, and World of Woodrow. We are here to discuss the second episode of BattleBots Champions. How are we doing, gents? Fantastic. <laughs> I'm okay. Oh, it's super good. I'm super good. I'm 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 ready to 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 just do it all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this 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 series so far has not been a letdown. I've enjoyed all of it thoroughly. Yeah, Absolutely. it's been quite a it's been quite a good time. Uh, we we've been uh, led to believe by many rumblings amongst builders and fans alike that these are some of the best fights of the series so far. So, it's uh it's it's living up to it so far. Absolutely, and we are joined by as introduced by us, uh, Bryce and Evan Woolley from the Double Jeopardy team. How are you doing, Caps? It's uh, first time for you two on on the pod, and um, I think it's fair to say the most unique robot in BattleBots because no yeah. one else has a weapon like yours. <laughs> Right, we are we are the best cannon in Balbons. <laughs> you have that. You have that 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 monk here. That's that's what you that that's that is, that is yours to keep. <laughs> indeed, it is cannon. Uh. It absolutely is. Um, <laughs> this this week as well, we've, we've we've been very diligent and tried to get as many listener questions as we possibly can because you know I feel like it's a good way of fitting a gauge of what not just we think of you know every robot in the field, but of course the wider community. And there are a lot of questions regarding double jeopardy so yes. we'll start off with the user shaken shaken from discord uh, what inspired you guys to go with a cannon in the first place i think that's kind of an obvious place to start really yeah sure yeah and that's kind of a good segue into the a little bit of the history of the team uh so we had started doing combat robotics back in 2001 um with a 60 pound horizontal spinner um thought it was a great time and then our, our original goal was to make it onto BattleBots. Uh, we never did um, for various reasons, uh, but that was always a dream. You know, it's seen it as kids on Comedy Central. Uh, and so we all, always wanted to make it to the big stage. Uh, and then when we heard that BattleBots had returned in 2015, we were really excited and we thought, well, we gotta try and get on. And at that time, um, we had kicked around a couple of ideas as a team about what we would wanna pitch to BattleBots uh, to have the best chance of uh, getting on, um, I think Bryce, you pitched something that is actually somewhat conceptually similar to SME. Yes. Um, to begin with, and so so we were debating a lot of different ideas. Um, our our third team member, uh, our dad, uh, pitched a, a drum bot, uh, basically. Um, but we thought to really maximize our chances of getting on the show, because there's tons of wonderful builders out there, especially the ones that really dialed in uh, the spinner designs. The, best way for us to uh, get onto the show was to pitch something truly unique, something that had never, ever been done before. And when we saw in the rules that were released, I think in uh, 2016, um, was the first time they allowed untethered projectiles ever in the history of combat robotics. Uh, and so we thought if we pitch that, <laughs> that's going to give us the best chance of getting it because probably nobody else is foolish enough uh, to pitch a cannon. So we applied uh, with Double Jeopardy, then called Capital Punishment, uh, for the 2016 season, and we did not make it. Uh, they were concerned that we would kill a spectator, uh, which, you know, as lawyers, we are very attuned to the concerns about liability. So we appreciate that. Um, and we thought the best way to prove that it wasn't going to kill anybody, and also that it was actually cool and could work, was to start building it. And so that's what we did. Um, of course, the reboot had taken a break in 2017, so we were just taking the time to uh, refine the prototypes. We did some original prototypes out of PVC, a couple of different valve arrangements, kind of uh, worked on a lot of different mechanisms, and then eventually uh, we were accepted into the 2018 season. Um, and we do think that's because we had, you know, a unique design. And that was our goal with the 2018 season, and the single shot was to prove that a cannon could actually do damage to battle bots. And I think we certainly proved that and we've been uh, refining the design ever since. It is, it is just the most unique robot out there. Like it's like, it's, it's, it's a simple idea. Like you see it in, you know, Facebook feeds all the time, you know, YouTube comments, what have you stick a gun on it. 
and this is the the this, actual... this is the, the epitome of sticking gun <laughs> stick on, a gun it. on it. Really it I mean, um, we kind of had that with Brutus with its fireworks guns, but that's not really yeah, a projectile. Like that's cannon. all. That's all. All fireworks and and special yeah. effects and raw. But <laughs> this is real. This is yes, a tr- this truly... is one hundred percent true steel shooting at your face. <laughs> so. Hey. It's it's phenomenal. Um, a, a question that a lot of people ask as well, which I kind of alluded to before we started recording this. Um, how much does the whole pneumatic system, cannon system, weigh on Double Jeopardy? Because I imagine it's not very light. <laughs> yeah. Um. So the uh, of course the weight limit for the robots is two hundred and fifty pounds. Uh, some tough parts about that for the cannon design is that the slugs go towards that weight, and so every slug that we have, this is the actual slug that we fired at Ribot. Um, these are five pounds. We have other two, uh, two and a half pound slugs as well. Um, but those go towards our weight. And then the nitrogen that we carry uh, go towards our weight. We carry about a pound of nitrogen. And so on top of that, we have a huge cannon. Um, and that's the really the center of the design is this huge cannon. We could probably optimize it and make it smaller, but we don't want to do that. Uh, we think the cannon is really cool. And so uh, in 2018, we used threaded fittings because it was easier because we didn't have to, then it was off the shelf pressure rated stuff. And that cannon weighed well over hundred pounds. Um, and I think that the current cannon uh, uses um, welded fittings that we have to, it's, it's a whole production. We get it welded by a certified ASNI welder because it's a pressure vessel, right? So um, some amateur could not do it. It wouldn't be safe. You have then to have like to some be, actual paperwork sort of thing to prove yeah, that it's been done exactly. properly. That, yeah, we, we have to show all the certifications for this stuff. Then we have it uh, uh, heat treated and stress relieved and then hydro tested. And actually our brand new um, Canon for the next iteration of Double Jeopardy uh, was just getting hydro tested this week. But it, it's quite the process. And I think the new version of Double Jeopardy with the welded fittings um, that are much uh, a smaller schedule, a smaller thickness than the threaded fittings from DJ 2018, the whole cannon is still probably about hundred pounds. I think the, the first version of the cannon was like 140 pounds. It was an insane amount of weight. Um, but right now I think probably the entire, the cannon arrangement is about hundred pounds, maybe a bit more. Very good. Um, next question from, uh, I think it's a Discord user, Bits Team Heatwave asks, what material is the slugs made of? Sure, that's a great question. Um, this one is the uh, cylindrical slug. It's just mild steel. I think it's like, uh, I, I forget the exact um, alloy. The reason why it's this, one thing that's cool, it's a very soft steel, so it deforms nicely when you hit stuff like Ribot. Um, and so it looks cool. That means we can't really reuse them, right? Because we're not gonna stick this back in the barrel. It's not really gonna fit. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's just a mild steel. The uh, balls, I don't know that I have one in my workshop, Uh, around here somewhere. They're a much harder alloy of steel. So when we actually fire those, you don't really see, even when there's a direct hit, um, the second shot in the Ribot fight hit their undercutter and took a chunk out of it. Um, We have some images of that. And like, you can't even see a scuff on the ball because it's such a hard steel. Um, They're steel, basically. (laughs) There you go. Um, Which ones are we going for next? We'll go for a question from outside of the box host, Christine Giver, and she asks, what benefits and challenges are there to building such a unique weapon? I mean, the benefit is that it's really cool. Um, and and that's, <laughs> really, that, that's really what- Perfect we, reason. Yeah, as a team, <laughs> is we're interested in building something cool. And that's that's the most kind of fulfilling, exciting, fun part about this whole process. You know, getting to compete with it, being on TV is icing on the cake, but getting to build something cool that works that's the most satisfying thing. Um, and we, we get a lot more excitement out of it than just doing like a spinner or some other you know design that a lot of other people would do much better than we would. Um, and that's part of the fun too. Nobody has built a better cannon than us. I'm sure somebody, <laughs> nobody that's has what we're talking about. Better. Yeah, and um, if I could make a quick addition to that before we go to the challenges, one of the reasons that we do it in the same line of um, being unique is one of the mantras that our dad has, uh, Bill, you know, integral part of the team, unfortunately, couldn't be here, is that we treat this as a battle of ideas, more than a battle of actual, you know, robots, so to speak, or in a sense. And we just love the creative process. To us, that's one of the most fun parts. Yeah, and then uh, there are plenty of challenges for uh, going with the canon design. Um, uh, 
probably the biggest one is that there's really no resources out there. There's no guidance. There's no tips. We're blazing the trail with every single thing that we do. There's a wonderful, wonderful book um, by Captain Marco of the uh, Professor Megalario from the Minotaur team, um, the RioBots Combat Robotics Tutorial. Mm -hmm. If you want to build a spinner or a lifter or any sort of traditional weapon design, they have put a ton of resources in that book for you, and it can get you started. There is nothing, nothing like that. <laughs> there are no resources. Yeah, robot, robot combat ballistics have a little bit of a, you know, catching up to do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's been the biggest challenge. And a good example of that is, is one, of the, one of the many design challenges of the cannon uh, is how do you open the cannon valve quickly, right? Um, because the way Double Jeopardy works is it's, it's this trident shape, right, for the cannon. The back U is the tank. Then there's the valve in the in the still image of Double Jeopardy. You can see the yellow Kinetrol rotary van like that sits on top of the valve. That's the that's the yeah. actuator for the valve. Hmm. Um, so and then in front of that is just the barrel. So the way it works is we just open and close the valve, which opens and closes the tank, which fires the projectiles. I am sure there are a million other much more sophisticated ways to do it. There was a, another projectile robot that has pitched the last couple of seasons broadside. Um, I would be very excited. Uh, to see their design. It's a, it's a much different approach to a cannon design than us. They use dynamic O-rings and control rods and, and all this stuff. Um, but ours is uh, kind of old school in the sense that we're literally just opening and closing the valve. We have to open and close it quickly so we have enough pressure yeah. for subsequent shots. Um, and that's been the big challenge. How do you open a valve that has extraordinarily high actuation torque very, very quickly? because the actuation torque for this valve, and it's literally just a ball valve, it goes up with the pressure differential, right? And so when the cannon is pressured up to 3000 PSI, which is the max they let us go, and there's you know just atmospheric pressure on the other side, the actuation pressure or the actuation torque to open and close that valve is over 120 foot pounds. That's a lot of torque to implement very, very quickly because you want to do it in fractions of a second. So how do you do that? I don't know. There's no chapter in the in the, in the book about how Re to build robots are, robots letting the team down here, not not doing enough yeah. comments, clearly. <laughs> exactly. So so we had to figure it out. And in the first iteration of Double Jeopardy, the way we did it, since we only had the one shot, we just had to open once, is we used mm -hmm. a very unusual kind of spring steel torsion spring design that we would take this loop of spring steel and cock it and then unleash it with a trigger mechanism that would open the valve. It was, it was so old school. <laughs> yeah, it was a pain in the butt to deal with. Um, and so, again, there's a million ways, I'm sure, that you could actuate a valve. A lot of people just say, oh, why don't you use a solenoid valve, right? That's true. They exist. We do have a solenoid valve on the robot. Um, I don't think you can see it in the image. It's on the end of the tank as a purge valve uh, for a safety feature because we're required to have that. We're required to have a way to purge the system uh, in the event of something crazy happening. That's a solenoid valve. It's tiny. It has a very low flow because it's a very tiny valve. There are solenoid valves that exist with higher flow, but they're huge and they weigh about 50 pounds. So it's not going to be feasible. I say, when, when, you, when, your, when your weaponry already weighs, you know, 100 plus pounds, having yeah. another, you know, yeah. just, just a valve for 50 pounds isn't, you know, it's not leaving a lot left, you know, in terms of yeah. weight for the rest of the robot. It's yeah, very similar exactly. to Deep Six, you know, where like so much weight is put into your weapon. How much more do you have to have for your rest of your your, your mobility, your armor, your your other essentials? I'm that sure you this won't come up again with. in this episode. That's, that's, <laughs> yes, that, that's the that's the selection we've chosen for Double Jeopardy. The, the number one priority is put the weight into the weapon because that's what the robot is about. Number two has been the drivetrain, and number three is like if we have anything left over, we can use it for the tinfoil armor. <laughs> um, last question before we get on to the episode itself and the, and the fights. Um, for now, uh, obviously, you mentioned earlier the previous name of uh, Double Jeopardy was Capital Punishment. Yes. Why did it change? Well, um, at the time, we were originally pitching uh, Double Jeopardy. Uh, I was working uh, in the intellectual property litigation practice group of the law firm Alston and Bird, uh, and we actually got them to sponsor the robot. Uh, and so you can see the Alston and Bird name on some of the Double Jeopardy panels um, from 2018 and 2019. And I thought it was really cool um, that they would do that. And we, you know, had to show them all the, the, all the sponsor assets and everything to get their approval. And they decided they were a little nervous about a T-shirt that would say Capital Punishment sponsored by Alston and Bird. They thought that would be a little bit <laughs> impressive stance 
um, on that hot button issue. So they're like, well, could you possibly change it? Um, and it was actually Bryce that came up with the current name of the bot. Yeah, I actually came up, we had uh, Evan talked about before that we do various prototypes to test this really creative idea. And we love puns. So um, uh, one of them was lightweight prototype that we called LWP. It was like our midsize one, life without parole, lesser punishment. <laughs> and it Funny. went all the way down to this tiny little Vex thing that shot little ping pong balls and we called oh, yeah, that we nominal that damages. Oh, really? Awesome. <laughs> I love reason, seeing prototypes. Yeah, the reason we went with double jeopardy. This was just uh, like is, for kicks, really. Awesome. The cool. awesome. <laughs> Kids can play with it. Kids have played with it. It's cute. Um, and it won't, it doesn't have as much danger as um, even lightweight prototype Life Without Parole uh, had a lot of danger. And then the reason we changed it to Double Jeopardy uh, was, again, we love pins, uh, puns, is that it plays up the twin part. It plays up the lawyer part. And when we started with just one shot, uh, you know, Double Jeopardy, the legal clause of the Fifth Amendment says that you can't be tried or convicted for the same crime twice. So the idea is um, uh, with the shot, you can't get hit, you know, twice. And also the Fifth Amendment doesn't apply in the battle box. We go, we take it pretty far. I mean, it's, it's, I'll, I'll bring this up now because there was actually a question later on. Um, have you both ever presented in a case of double jeopardy before? <laughs> no, but I actually teach the subject for the California bar exam. Oh, there you go. Oh, awesome. So there is a tie-in. <laughs> One, one thing I wanted to ask, I don't know if it's on the questions. Uh, have you ever thought of trying to find a way to retrieve your shots after they've been shot so that you can shoot them again? We, we have considered that. And the sort of the, our current thinking is that any sort of mechanism for retrieving and reloading would be complicated, um, probably not do too well when it gets jostled around by vicious robots like Ribot, mm -hmm. um, and any weight that would go into that, we'd rather just add more shots, right? right. Than back yeah. back I was, I was so going to say, they, the there was a featherweight that had a retrievable harpoon, wasn't there? Was it, was it Motorama a few years ago? I can't remember, but there, there was, there was a projectile firing sportsman featherweight that had like mm -hmm. a harpoon on a, on like a, a wire and it, and it was able to retract it. <laughs> oh, I'm sure that would get wrapped up with all sorts of yeah. Uh, entanglement mm, yeah, issues. Sure, sure, they'll be you know they'll come down. Oh no, hard. our tether has been caught around your I, bicycle. Spare I'm starting to remember shape. an old Scrap Daddy robot back in the old BattleBots days that did have a problem with that, uh, <laughs> where they had a a a buoy on the end of a long string and it would whack <laughs> things, but it did get wrapped up in another robot and they had to remove it. Uh, so yeah, and that's a problem with the uh, entanglement devices rule in BattleBots. So there was a lot of, I mean, it's a fun, really interesting idea to talk about. We yeah. did consider it in the very early thoughts about we still want to do a projectile mechanism, even though there's uh, they're not allowed untethered or there's a lot of limitations mm -hmm. on that. Uh, but there was a lot of considerations going into it. It was actually part of an interesting uh, back and forth on um, one of the threads about double jeopardy after our match. Mm -hmm. Very good. Right. Should we talk about some fights? Yeah. Yes, please. Sweet. I so feel like I want to talk more double jeopardy though. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, look, do you know what? It's good because our first fight was double jeopardy against Ribot, so we can talk wow. about, absolutely can talk about more double jeopardy. Um, first of all, how happy were you to have a one-on-one -on -one fight for the first time in three years? Yeah, well, it's so much better. Rumbles are terrible. Um, <laughs> I don't think they. I don't think they make great TV. You heard it here first. And, yeah, a, a rumble is is it's just chaos. So there's not really. You can't, it's it's chaotic enough in the battle box and then to have just more people to think about. And especially because they would always put us in rumbles with the four horsemen. So we get, we're not going against two robots, yeah. we're going against like six, right? So, Ridiculous. Um, or something like that. So it, it, it's it's a pain in the butt. Um, yeah. More targets, I guess. Uh, but we prefer the one-on-ones um, a lot. And we were excited to draw Ribot because that's, that's a, a real high, high end opponent. And that was the idea is if, if if we yeah could number pull two off the seed win, in the competition yeah, yeah if we could pull off the win that would be huge um, yeah. so we were we were excited um, for the matchup I mean it was I I, I want to say I want to give them a little bit of credit for for positioning themselves just nicely in front of the cannon and, yeah. and, and, and letting you uh, like well we do have a, a, a one of the questions which is from uh, Matt Hedger was how uh, no wrong person Aiden muted there we go yes how satisfying was it to hit the frog head. Oh, it was very, well, I guess the slug hit um, the front panel and yeah. uh, we have some good images where it actually took off one of the screws it's on the front of here, panel. Yeah. There's a nice, basically crescent shape where the 
the slug hit it directly. It was wow. just the, the the nitrogen cloud, just the, the air pressure that took the frog out. Um, but it was we were excited about it because finally, that's the thing that's that's a, another challenge of the double jeopardy design is it's a part of it might be it's so unusual. People like they can literally watch the show and they don't know what they saw. Like one of the main comments that we saw, it's like, oh, it's too bad you missed Ribot. It went right over Ribot. And it's like, no, you can, in the slow-mo, you can see the slug bounce off. You can see the spark of it hit the front panel. Yeah. But that's the thing. People like literally don't even know what they're watching. Mm. And so um, aside from that, we were thrilled about the frog head thing because finally it's like something cool and visual and exciting um, uh, that we really like. That's probably the, I think probably the coolest um look of a double jeopardy shot since the mecha rampage match yes, the, which is the target yes. the little target above the, the robot and it hits it perfectly yeah and they put it in the teaser they that's, did. Right. And that, that's another thing too for survivability and and the, the ability to come back each time is to make sure that you have clips that can be put into battle bots as yeah. highlight reels or pre-reels or stuff like that i totally understand that and now you, it looks like you really really have one now because that's a huge yes. i mean the eye-catching thing the fact that they played that clip at least four times over in the replays, it it was a pretty impressive shot. What I enjoyed though from this fight was what we got as BattleBot supporters, uh, the onboard footage. We got uh, a slam cam. Yeah, which <laughs> yes. there's a moment where Ribot hits that front leg and panel. And at that point, <laughs> you just want to yell, hull breach. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this is the actual front panel. Oh, here we um, go. Oh, match. yeah. So as you can see, uh, he did a mm. number on it. Um, <laughs> wow. This is, this is titanium. I think it's only 0. 0.1 thick. It's not very thick, right? It's not tin um, foil. <laughs> no. Yeah, but it's, yeah, this is tough stuff. And we're just, we're thrilled that the camera survived. And so we yeah. were able to get that footage. That's so good. Yeah, because that's the one thing. Stuff. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, because you see, you, you saw a lot this season. Robots getting completely ripped apart in half. Fall, flying all over the place but this shows like the some of the durability of double jeopardy if we can call it that where <laughs> the camera is running the whole time um that's an aspect of the design of having uh the slanted front so i'm happy that we got a good uh clip from that yeah definitely uh i will say uh in the reboot I, I, I really do wish we would have more mounted cameras on these robots because back in the day in a comedy central days the camera systems you had to put on robots to get them to just get something filmed. We forget how big camcorders used to be and to have them on your robot and then have to deal with that and weight distribution. And at the first you even have, you need to even have a space on your robot that can have that. Uh, where now you could put a little GoPro or something like that and just stick well, it right in your it, robot. 2018, AC, they tried yeah. the, uh, they did the try Insta it. I remember ones, it. the 360 yes. cameras, which mm -hmm. they're really great cameras, very expensive to replace yes. when they get hit, knocked or anything like that. Um, and they were always sticking out of the robot at bizarre yes. angles so that they could get the best 360 degree view. Mm -hmm. What I'd considered doing for a, a smaller weight class house robot back a few years ago now was have one of those cameras be the central focal point in the robot, have a big dome over the top of it so that it can see all the way around it still, but it's protected in the middle of the robot, uh, and then do weapons either side of it or something like that. I don't know, but um, that, that was my thinking. But those Insta360s, they're good. Um, I have one somewhere and I can't find it, but... Um, yeah, they're not very battle-hardy. No, at least not no. in the, at least and not they in the don't, box. Because of how they work, you can't really encase it in anything other than what I suggested like, is a big sort of see through dome. Yeah, a big bowl. Damn. Yeah, which, let's be real, isn't going to protect your robot against something of Ribot's caliber. Um, <laughs> I mean, but, obviously, fight back to the fight slightly, you know, for a second. Obviously, you know, Ribot went in there. They obviously, I, I'll give them a lot of credit for, for le letting them, you know, letting yourselves, you know, kind of get that glory shot, if you like, and just yeah. like, Take the, take was the there left. an agreement beforehand that like they would give you a chance to really get a glancing blow or a, a uh, direct no, hit? No, I think, well, see, that, that's the funny thing is you, you maybe uh, the outside observer might think, oh, Ribot is being nice and everything. It's like, no, they were being very clever and defensive because that's the he most heavily armored part of the robot yeah, um, okay. is that front scoop. And prior to the match, uh, their first plan was to run the vertical disc. Um, they eventually switched to the undercutter uh, pretty close to the beginning of the match. Uh, because they they wanted that extra armor in the front panel. So, you know, maybe maybe we would have been more lucky with the vertical disc because if we hit that dead on, it probably would have broken it, and then yeah. we would have been able to to maybe win the match. So you know, it's not like Ribot wasn't 
teeing it up. They took you seriously. Nice. They, yes. they were they were presenting their most their, their strongest defense. And because mm-hmm. that was our hope was that if we could hit them on the side, that's one of the more weakly defended parts. Like mm-hmm. literally the chains are right there. And so mm-hmm. had we hit them broadside, we would have completely disabled the side of the drivetrain. And so it's not that they were being nice. It's that they were being defensive. Yeah. And who's to say that like a very similar uh, thoughts when like, like, like when you well, like when a gun is shot, uh, it's, it's not necessarily the bullet doing the damage. It's the recoil. Uh, where all that all that force has to disperse somewhere, and if it disperses through the robot, maybe we'll knock something loose. You know, you never you you never know. Uh, so yeah, the concussive force is actually part of the. There's we got we have so much to talk about with why don't you do a pointed slug? Uh, but the concussive force is a lot of damage, especially we did that to Gamma Nine, and you did see that robot did have some. Uh, it did push him back a little bit. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I, it, ended up, it ended up denting that front panel, even though that's I think an AR panel. So. It's crazy. I think as, as well, like another thing that they brought up was like the fact that you can you can hit them straight out the gate and they can't do anything about it. So, you know, let's say if you're front on like and they had the vert, you could have, you could have hit it, lights go green, bang, straight away, done. Game over. Yeah, well, something our dad always likes to mention is that we are the only battle bot that can get you from completely across the arena. Yeah, it's, it's great. Um, it did end up. Going slightly sideways, not long after that, the <laughs> robot weapon is nothing to be sniffed at, and that there was that one glorious hit where all three of the wheels mm. just get chopped yes. all yeah. at once. It was beautiful to watch. I mean, obviously, very painful for you to watch in in the arena, but like spectacular for TV. And you know, I think it was a great showcase between you know two unique robots in the robot. Obviously, robot has its many weapon modules and what have you, but it's it's. This is a lovely fight. I was so happy to see it, and it was it was great. It was really really good. Yeah, and again, yeah, we were thrilled to be up against a, a top tier opponent, and we just wish we got a better chance to show off the drivetrain because actually, I think Double Jeopardy for this last season had the most powerful drivetrain of any robot in the field. Claw Viper had the second most powerful because wow. we have uh, six Castle twenty twenty eights, so six wheel direct drive. With the mm-hmm. Castle 2028s um, into uh, the super heavy duty, I think 16 to 1 Zebra gearboxes. And so mm-hmm. it's actually the most, uh, uh, you know, we had some trouble with our wheels. We weren't getting the best traction. So maybe in on the ground, it might not have had more pushing power than someone like Claw Viper. But on paper, it's the it's the most powerful drivetrain. In That's the field. crazy. Is there a reason why it's six wheel drive? That is another question I have written down here. Like, is, is it yes. for any specific reason? <laughs> Um, well, I mean, as you can sort of see, Double Jeopardy has actually one of the largest footprints um, of the whole field. Let's see mm-hmm. if you can just, it's quite large, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's because the cannon is huge. And th- that's the whole ethos of the robot, right? It- it's-, it's designed to carry around a giant cannon. And mm-hmm. the cannon is very long. And so to basically have a drivetrain fit around that cannon, it needs to be long. And so we wanted six wheel drive to avoid um, having a wheelbase that was uh, too narrow or to avoid some of the pitfalls of that where you're scrubbing the wheels as you turn. Yeah, another another fun fact about this, really early on with Double Jeopardy, we considered treads to make it a literal tank. <laughs> yes, that's so good. Oh, dearie me. I, 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 want, I want that, man. That's, that's, that's good. Um, that sounds good. <laughs> we will talk a little bit more about Double Jeopardy a little bit later on, but we'll, we'll move on to our second fight uh, of the night, which was Slamo and Malice. I have some information about this fight. Okay. I will just find it. Carry on. Yes. Um. I want to say Craig left a message on uh, on your Discord, Jeff. But basically, what, but what happened was they had to rebuild the entirety of the Slamo frame for this fight. Um. The two fights previously against uh, Switchback and Hypershock really left it in quite a bad way, and he went down to two wheel drive. Um. It didn't. Well, it, it was working until it wasn't. I think in this fight, it's fair to say because. Craig was driving so well, and then one small error up on his back, and Malice took complete advantage, didn't it? Yeah, I have here the statement from Mr. Danby. Okay. Um, so after fight nights, as you said, Sam, uh, they had to completely rebuild the robot from the ground up. Literally nothing was the same from the first fight. New chassis, new drive, new electronics, new weapon uh, drive uh, for the 2020 weapon, in fact. Uh, To get the new drive to fit, they lifted the rear axle an inch, which meant their five-inch wheels couldn't touch the floor anymore. Uh, And there was no front axle anymore. So they bought some wheels uh, from McMaster that were bigger so that it could move. 
um, they didn't have another choice, basically, in that uh, the chain on the weapon kept slipping on the end uh, of the swing, so that's probably a, a link too long, Craig says, um, but it didn't return as expected, which we, we saw in the fight. Uh, it kept getting stuck backwards a couple of times. Yeah. I must say, with all that said and done, Jesus, Slamo did very well in this fight. Yep. <laughs> Considering it's well. basically it's basically the ship of Theseus, like it's nothing is the same. No, it's not it's, the it's same not, robot it's anymore. Not, it's Slamo twenty twenty two at this point, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. not the new one. No, uh-huh. um, it was incredibly impressive on one wheel for the majority of the fight as well. Um, that they managed to defend against Malice and even get Malice turned up against a wall. I genuinely thought in that moment, oh my god, he's done it, uh, and then Malice just rocks forwards. I, I yep. thought when it kind of. It, Malice did the thing last year when it got stuck on its back, and I thought for a second yeah. when it was gyroing around with the disc, I thought, oh my god, it's done it again. I can't believe yeah. it. <laughs> but, yeah. but it's got I the th- tail this time. It's There fine. was a moment where I thought it was going to get stuck on its front and do the other thing, um, oh. which, yeah, put a, put a tail on that one. Um, mm. But yeah, it, it didn't. It came down and then it spoiled Craig's day. Um, yeah. <laughs> but it was, a, it was a really good fight. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. So, did you have any like views from the pits at all for this fight at all? Or? Oh, there's sorry. Before we answer that question, if there's something we've actually really wanted a pairing against Malice because you know yeah. we are courageous because of this, <laughs> the really large cavity that it has in front, depending on the weapon that it does. Oh, yes. and it would be so awesome to see the slug go right in there. That would yeah. be amazing. That would be a really cool slow mo shot if you could get that, just to see like you know. Yeah, so be, maybe maybe next year because they like to ask like who you want to fight, and so we're gonna just keep pushing. We want to fight Malice. Uh, <laughs> so, well, Let's you finally it. got your first one on one, so you're, you're you're due for another. Yeah, that's right. Um, but yeah, so th- th- what you're saying that's a, that's one of the reasons why Craig is one of our favorite builders um, in BattleBots. He's he's definitely one of the hardest working people there because there are definitely other teams that have just faced the attrition right of of just the all the matches and all the destruction and you know, kind of packed it up and gone home. And Craig will rebuild his entire robot in the pits and go out and put on a really great show. Yeah, yeah. he's he's that kind of guy. And he's a top lad. We, we love Craig here and we do. And ho- hopefully we see him again next year. I you know he's, he's been busy beavering away at, on the new Slambo. It was basically built the new version of Slambo as he got back from BattleBots, I think he, he said before. So yeah. fingers crossed we see it again in, uh, in 2022. Fight number three. Uh, my boys, Shatter and Pain Train. This New York, New ba- York, so Battle good of they New York. It twice. Yeah. yeah, and it's like the Mets and the Yankees, but just more bloody. Yeah. <laughs> At the start, I was very concerned because it was all Pain Train. It was all yeah. Pain Train. He and had I th- no breaks. <laughs> the thing is, like, we, and we discussed this with the Shatter team when we spoke to them about their fight with Riptide. The kind of wide surface area of the weapon is not something that Shatter can deal with quite well. Like horizontals, it's kind of got an answer for. Verticals, you know, it's got the really long forks. You can just kind of keep them at arm's reach and, you know, don't touch me. Drums and, you know, robots of, you know, egg beaters, that kind of wide vertical mm-hmm. spinner style, it doesn't really have an answer for yet because it doesn't have something that can, it, it can't close down the angles fast enough because of the its, its drive style. Yeah. Um, And the front end, there's nothing really there that's like, in, in their arsenal that we've seen so far that's kind of been resistant to it. Everything's kind of the, the front end with for the horizontals, for example, the kind of flat front, which they used against deep six isn't quite the right style of, you know, design. No, to fight. We saw that fight against Minotaur a few seasons mm-hmm. back and uh, it, it, it went okay for them. It held off Minotaur for a while, but they, they weren't winning that judge's decision based on just that alone. And I think had Pain Train kept working as it was at the start, it wouldn't have won this judge's decision either. I think it was no. very, very... I think it got a good shot on yeah. the weapon. And as, mm-hmm. like, you see kind of a few sparks fly out. And after that point, the weapon wasn't working for the majority of the fight and Shatter was able to come in and play. Yeah, yeah. It, it seems like the more... the more, uh, How do I want to say this? The, the more of your robot on like one side that is weapon, Shatter has trouble with. Uh, so if it's more focused in one spot, uh, so say if you have a vert... Uh, it, it, it seems to, it seems to be able to deal with that a little better, uh, and get around it where, where with, with such a wide weapon with drums or egg beaters and stuff like that, it, it even with its drive, uh, it, it still has, a uh, it still has trouble f- trying to find a way to, uh, you know, to find a way in, but thankfully for their, on, on their, you know, 
for them, it it shut down and they just went ham. They just went, they they became the judge. It, it, it was like watching a judge fight again, where it just boom, ba boom, ba boom, just over and over and over again. Yeah. Uh, it was awesome. I am going to ask because, you know, I feel like it'd be remiss of me not to. I feel like Omni Drive would be amazing on Double Jeopardy. Yeah. <laughs> not to complicate things <laughs> further, obviously. <laughs> How yeah, is, it, be, is it feasible? <laughs> I, I think it is. And, and one of the interesting things is that Double Jeopardy already owes a lot of debt to Shatter for our drivetrain. Is that the mm-hmm. when we did the brushless upgrade, we went from two long amp flows of chain drive that was in Double Jeopardy uh, 2019 or 2018 and 2019. When we built Double Jeopardy for 2020, we had the same brushless drive. We had to pull out of the season because of the scheduling issues that keep getting keeping getting pushed around um, from mm-hmm. COVID. It was at a time when I think Bryce was teaching. I was taking depositions in an ITC case, and our dad was out at a rocket test facility in Mojave. So the filming for 2020 just didn't work out for us. Um, but the robot was basically built, uh, mm-hmm. and we thought for 2021 we needed the time. Why not make an upgrade? And we had never touched anything brushless before. And so the template that we used for the brushless drive for Double Jeopardy is actually Shatter's old drivetrain. Um, and Adam had written uh, some great blog posts about their design um, using the Castle 2028s and the Bainbox gearboxes. And so the Double Jeopardy drive is actually very, very similar to an early version of Shatter's drive, though Shatter has four wheel drive and we have six. Um, and so we, were, we had been asking them about that because they were saying, hey, you guys should try um, the, the Omni wheel drive or holonomic or whatever the, uh, the mechanum, I don't know which specific. What, what are the kids are calling it these yeah, days? Exactly. <laughs> Magic float around and, the arena. Nobody can touch me drive. Yeah. yeah and, and we were saying, you know, our concern is that we, you lose some of the torque, um, from, from that and you lose some of the speed and, and their response was they'd actually run the numbers and, and the reduction in, in speed versus what they would get with just traditional wheels. It's, much smaller than you would think. It's like 10% or something like that, or maybe 20 max. Uh, and so that was their pitch. You know, you guys should consider this. It could be really helpful. So we have thought about it, um, but you know, I don't know. I've never had any experience with that, with that kind of drive. Um, and we like to we like to iterate on just a, a few things at a time. So That's fair uh, yeah, and with every, with every design choice, it's a trade-off. So here, uh, Evan mentioned that we might lose a little bit of power, which is not great because we become a push bot after we expend our shots. So we need to be able to push them around and all of that strength really matters. On the other hand, having uh, the Omni capability would make aiming and when uh, deciding when to fire probably a lot easier. It's, yeah, you're right. It is a trade-off, and ultimately, I feel like you, you're right. Uh, once you've fired, you, however many shots you have in going forward, like it's, you need that kind of bullying power. And you know, we've, we've seen before. You know, Shatter does get pushed around quite, quite easily with the Omni Drive. It's, it, obviously, it's not an exact science, but it, it's it's there's still a, you know a loss of grip and a loss of you know pushing power that they that they have. So. Yeah, I, I do I completely understand why you wouldn't want to go for that, that route. Fight number four. I mean, this is probably the fight I was most excited for when I saw the fight card, I have to say. Deep six versus huge. The two two silly, silly big spinners. And uh, didn't really go the way I expected. No. Um, turns out that you can punch a big old hole in Tegris with uh, a meaty vertical spinner. Um Ow! <laughs> <laughs> it was inc- that 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 hit was incredible. Uh, there was also the, the big you know full send you know when it connects perfectly. The weapon yeah, stops the, on deep the, six and the the chins took the hit, but almost too well in that it it really did get uppercutted into the ceiling area, but not the ceiling. It's nothing has ever touched the ceiling in the battle box yet. So. Which is interesting because Jonathan Schultz does say before this fight that it's like fighting uppercut but bigger. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this robot. It was spectacular, wasn't it? I think the first hit from, De- from Deep Six really dictated the fight as well because Huge wasn't driving happily. I think it spat out a drive belt almost instantly. Um, mm-hmm. And after that point, it, it the was able to... belts came out as well. As... Yeah. Yeah. It was... so what, I, what I loved about this fight too is that it was a great example of Deep Six's driving. Um, yes. When they made the very smart, which is really hard to do in the heat of the moment, the decision to turn the weapon off for a while right? Let it cool down, uh, avoid the gyroscopic force. You can see it was actually moving pretty fast. Good turning. It was the fastest I've ever seen Deep Six move. And so I thought it was a really fun It was fun smoking way. the tires. 
It was smoking the tires on the floor. It was amazing. I think as well with with, with Deep Six. I think you mentioned them turning the weapon off. I think they lost their main weapon belts and they were using the Streamek chain because it doesn't spin quite as fast and it was really struggling to spin up. Yeah. But it, when it, it, it because it's so heavy and because it has obviously some inertia to it when it was spinning up, it was still able to knock huge around and give it a hard time. But mm-hmm. wowee, it was very impressive performance from Deep Six. I, I don't think we really appreciated the, the driving no. skill of, of Dusted until this fight. Slept no. on it. De- definitely yeah. slept on it. Deep Six has stepped up a notch from uh, punting a elephant in the face, then hitting the floor and then dying uh, to to what we saw in this episode. Um, it really was impressive. And uh, yeah, I, I, I love I Deep gotta Six. Say- I got to say, it gives me the same kind of feelings, like the butterflies in my stomach that you get, like when I saw Nightmare go into the arena. It's the same feeling where you like, you know, either it's going to blow up or it's going to blow the other thing up. Yeah. Uh, Something amazing is going to happen, but you just don't know. Yeah. (laughs) And I would love to see a passing of the torch between those two robots. I'm going to keep saying it, Um, but it's it's just remarkable. Yeah. how uh, th- th- this was its glow up episode if there was one f- one robot that had a one night be- best night of its career it's deep six uh yeah. and i'm really excited to see it what it, if and when it comes back not you confirmed. spoke earlier steve about uh having moments that you can put on camera and have as your uh show reel to show this is what yeah. the robot can do deep six definitely picked up several in this episode oh absolutely <laughs> there there's one coming up later where i i, I don't I don't know if a robot could go backwards that fast, faster than double <laughs> jeopardy <laughs> shooting a projectile, but still similar effect. I, I, yeah. yeah that's feelings. a great example too of, of what we what we were hoping we could achieve uh, with if we got an upset win over Ribot is mm-hmm. it's it's tough to build that kind of reputation and to get that glow up when you just don't have as many matches to prove yourself. Because imagine what if uh, Deep Six their only match to prove themselves was the one where they got stuck in the kill soft slot. Yeah, Everybody can imagine talks the worst the worst season ever for Deep Six. They're mm-hmm. terrible. They can't even drive, right? And what if that's the only match that they gave them? It that would was be a, awful. That and was another thing. They they altered the forks. Uh, uh, like yeah. after that fight, they kind of got these like sort of stabilizer things at the front, so they couldn't get stuck in the kill source. Sort again. of yeah. more, It's almost tantrum esque. Those forks in that it has the bit of the side as well, uh, mm-hmm. sticking out to level off almost. It, it's good. Good planning. And, and that's that's the benefit of getting the multiple matches, right? And so Double Jeopardy, we've had six matches over the, the um, seasons that we've appeared, which is a good amount of time to be iterating our design. But I think if we really had a better opportunity, uh, like teams like uh, Deep Six have gotten, uh, we'd be able to have that kind of breakout performance. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I will say that uh, we knew about this fight somewhat in advance um, because yeah. the, the huge team may have spoken to us about it, but also then put it on a blog post, which as I was watching this fight, I thought back to, uh, and I've got it up in front of me, which says, um, we feel that the losses to Riptide and Uppercut were due to issues that we can resolve quickly. And we've gained helpful experience protecting our electronics and body within the last two fights. But hopefully we don't have to fight or don't have to find out if these changes work anytime soon. Then there's a picture of them against Deep Six, and it just says, oh, you've got to be kidding me. And I thought, that's brilliant. I love it. Yeah. And yeah, I, that is, I think, what was going through um, Jonathan Schultz's mind as this fight was going on, <laughs> because Tegra's chins, they protected the electronics, but the, the belts. Yeah. yeah. I, I will say another thing as well, like, very quickly before we move on. I was kind of a little bit surprised that the, I know you've got to kind of build up the fighting, you know, kind of build a story behind the fight. And the fact that they were kind of saying, oh, Hugh just had this really rough run of form. But I, I suppose, yeah, it has done. But like, they made the top 32 again. And, mm-hmm. you know, they, they fought robots specifically built to beat them. Something like, you know, Switchback is something that can reach it and uppercut as well. And, and Riptide, come on. <laughs> I, I feel like it, I feel like, the first year that huge showed up to battle box i feel battle to the battle box uh i feel like there was a huge uh focus put on it because it was just so different uh it was such a paradigm shift with such a different robot i think it was really expected to break the field wide open and it really hasn't uh maybe in the way that maybe production had bite force on the ropes come on steve (laughs) well well here here hear me out though where like i feel like people are a little too hard on it uh where it still has this 
it's still a growing robot. It's still a growing design. Yes, it did have bite force on the ropes. I do remember that. Um, but it's it's a tricky thing where I feel like it's it, it's having to, you know, already have championship pedigree when it's still, you know, there's still a lot of learning to be done with this robot. I feel like it's it. it, it I, I feel like Jonathan still has a lot to learn with this machine. Uh, and and I, I will say uh, it is tough having having to go up against a robot that I got, that can actually hit you where all your dangerous stuff is. Uh, yeah, which is you know, I mean, there's 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 still some learning to be done there to figure out. They have uh, started how to combat putting um, huge up against robots that can hit huge, um, yeah. and Calvin was alluding to it earlier on. It was yes, we can fight this type of thing really well. So BattleBots production will give you the complete opposite. Yes. <laughs> um, so we're a big wheel thing that can't touch us. Okay, here's the biggest the thing that can touch yeah. you. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's a shame, but I will say that Huge is a tried and tested design and it is setting a trend elsewhere in the world. I mean, we've seen a smaller version of Huge uh, at Norwalk Havoc take a title in the last mm -hmm. year or so. Um, Tom Brewster has built a Beetleweight style version called Stratus that just won uh, a Beetleweight event in the UK. He's al also got Straddle, which uh, does very nicely in the Featherweights. Uh, it, it's a good design. It works. And it works reliably and well. And I don't want to see more of it next year. So I hope this, yeah. this isn't used as an excuse for, oh, huge is on the downwards to kind of not no, no, invite no, no, no. them back next year because I, I need I'm, more huge. <laughs> I'm, I, I might install a parachute, you know, to make sure that like it doesn't come down so hard <laughs> as it did in this fight. Yeah. Uh, that was such a great hit. In a it field was. of try hard verts, this is the best a nice little vert. break. Yeah. It's a nice <laughs> little break in the paradigm to, to show what else you could do with a vertical spinner and the same goes for deep six um this was a vert fight but god it didn't feel like one with the excitement yeah. and the the huge hits that we were seeing in just massive weaponry yeah and going back to what you were saying sam like maybe it did have bite force on the ropes but maybe that's you know it, it, it's constantly trying to get back up to that point you know where like it almost had the champ beat but it didn't and now it's it's constantly trying to get back to that to that form even though that was only its first year like what like like i mean it's it's incredible but uh it you is. know, it'll come back. It will indeed. Always comes I'm, back. I'm sure it will do. Our first semi, Malice and Ribot. Ribot going, well, this is the first fight Ribot had had this season with a kinetic spinner, which, mm. yeah, considering they're five fights in at this point, is amazing. <laughs> well, if they had a longer bracket run, they would have run into a lot. <laughs> but, you know, it, just, it, did, it, it, it didn't pan out this time. I know. Um, driving expertise, really, from, from David Jin, wasn't it? It was... As, as smooth as you like, you know, they got the weapon stopped. I, I I do actually want to bring up a point. Someone left a comment saying that Malice's weapon ESC, the first one blew up against Slamo, and then their secondary blew up. Uh, it was either the, in the test box or early on in this fight, and basically Malice had a spin up time of fifteen seconds. Ooh. Hence, Ouch. hence, yeah, hence why they didn't really stand the chance against Ripot. Um, and you know. Credit to Ribot as well. They they kept the they kept the wedge pointed to them. They didn't give them a chance to spin up, and they saved their weapon from further damage as well by turning it off. It was probably an ideal fight for them, really. Yep. Yeah, the, the, the Ribot team is great. And they're they're really great sports. Um, we had a lot of fun with them uh, prior to our match, and uh, they, they I think you can remember from ours. Um, we kept trying to move around even when we had a lot of our drivetrain ripped out, and so David. Uh, you know, came in and gave the death blow. And he afterwards was like, I'm sorry, but you guys were still... <laughs> I, I, we, we always want to keep going until the robot's totally knocked out. But he, he is a, a great um, a great driver. Uh, and I think this was a very... Uh, this was an excellent showcase for just the, the quality of the robot and the skill of the team. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a shame for Manus because, again, you know, it would have been interesting to see how they would have fed had their spit up been more like it has been earlier in the season because there were fights this season where Malice was getting through those, you know, big horizontal plans. Look at Blacksmith, you know, it, yeah. it ripped Blacksmith apart, mm -hmm. but just wasn't to be on this occasion and Ribot just turned the screw and secured the bag. Yeah. It's yeah. And, and, and in this episode of the Battle of the Davids, uh, we had a uh, we had one frog and I, it, all, it, all like, of all of Bunny's Davids. <laughs> yeah, all of Bunny's Davids. Yeah, we had David Jin versus David Rush, and unfortunately, the Jin the Jin was better this time. Uh, I I will say that uh, it it was a shame to see Malice's weapon not spin up as fast as it normally does because that thing can do some serious damage. Yeah. Uh, but 
it it it, it just it just wasn't work working this time and maybe it was you know uh just just worn out it's it's a long tournament um i mean there's not much else to say this 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 fight was really one way traffic unfortunately i mean malice really didn't have a, a really a, a a chance to really jump on top in this fight it was really all ribot pushing and shoving and damage and it it it, it was everything you wanted in a ribot fight and it, it it's it's just a shame, you know, because she's you see this really cool paradigm shifting robot where it's just completely it's just completely different. Like there's nothing like it right now. I mean, you have this huge chunky drum disc. How, how do you describe it, Jevin? You have a chart. The, well, it's the uh, drumette. It's there you go. It's, a, it's the official term. OK, um, it's the first time we've said it this season as well, I think. It is. Yes. I think. Possibly. Comments will correct us if we're wrong. And I, the <laughs> season was so long ago now. I know. I know it. It is tricky, you know, to remember all the things that have happened since uh, since uh, the the season wrapped uh, months ago. Uh, but it, you know, it's it, it's a it's a good showing. I, I know I know they'll be back with something. I know they didn't make all the upgrades that they wanted to leading yeah. up to the season. This is basically 2020 malice with a a fresh like a paint. Uh, I'm I'm sure there's more improvements and with the bunny tail and stuff like that. But it's it, it's it's very much a similar a similar one that they brought with them to 2020. And I know that was a, a, a contentious point for, uh, for leading up to the season. So, but I imagine that if they, uh, they're accepted back and uh, they come back with uh, a fresh, a fresh look, uh, they have, they have a lot of things going for them, you know, cause I know that they were having trouble the first time they were out with belts. Uh, but this time around, it doesn't seem like that yeah, was no, it's speed controllers this time around. I've just been yeah. and done some digging into your earlier statements, Sam. So they've blown up three vest, uh, three Vex speed controllers this season one against mm-hmm. Tantrum, one against Jackpot, one against Slamo. Yeah. Um, and they had to swap to the Tramper Vests, which are brushless speed controllers, but they had to run it in brushed mode because uh, it's it's a brushed spinner. So, yep, um, right. it's got uh, tech. Yeah, yeah, 15 seconds of spin up time because it caps out at 50 amps there's there's the official word from the team mm-hmm. there we go last word on malice book the double jeopardy fight greg that's all i'll say yeah <laughs> yeah we, we want we want to see we want to see the slug go into into malice and see what happens mm-hmm. <laughs> can so you imagine we... it bouncing around in there as well as it's spinning whether it comes it, out or whether it stays in it'll be like last week where will decided to destroy and just go after a spinning weapon for just because <laughs> like throwing no matter a brick how... in a washing machine exactly literally exactly the same thing. exactly <laughs> who doesn't want to see that you know it's, it, you've seen the youtube videos of that happening oh, i want to see that happen in the battle box yep oh oh <laughs> this one hurts as, as, as a fan of shatter this this one hurts quite a lot i i thought and I, I don't want to say the team thought this because you know you can never you know underestimate any opponent that you have in the arena, especially not one with the weapon pedigree that Deep Six has. I thought this was going to be a Shatter will just drift around, cause a lot of gyro for Deep Six, and it will fall over. Shatter will get the hammer in, job done. I was very <laughs> very wrong. Oh my goodness me! Um, I not only jumped out of my chair when I was watching this, but I also yelled at the TV for the first time in a long time. Yep. Oh my God, what a hit. What yeah. a two hits, in fact. It hits it once, sends it up, spirals, hits it again, does about 80,000 barrel <laughs> rolls through the air, lands. And that happens at least twice in this fight. Mm-hmm. God above. I have to ask, you know, um, guys, being in the pits at this in this for this fight, what was the reaction? Because it must have been something pretty special. Oh yeah, like you you can tell when when something big happens because uh, and and you because it was great uh, for this season. They had uh, TVs sp- uh, interspersed throughout the pits, uh, so it was a lot easier as builders uh, to watch the matches. Um, but it's it's a lot of fun uh, to get that sort of you know. I'm trying to think of of, a, of another fight that had a similar reaction, but this was this was one of the biggest ones in the season. It was a really good fight. I like I, I I kind of as I said I kind of expected it to be like a not, a not a walkover for Shatter, but like I thought it would be comfortable. And for Deep Six to give it as many problems as it did do and hit it so hard, and it was the the shot where they go in opposite corners of the arena. That was the one for me. I was like, what an incredible fight! And it has ah. Yeah. Oh, so good. And then, okay, I will have to bring up, is it a days, be- you know, since controversy moment? Because I, I'm i not <laughs> sure. The next whether... couple fights have uh, have that on them. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure whether Shatter should have been counted out. It was... 
what do you stop the count at two seconds and then they still can't move? Like, wh- wh- where, where's the cutoff? See, they're the not issue. taking. They're I not think... taking the flight to deep six. True. They uh, see. This is the thing. It they was moving. Definitely it's translate tricky. at the end of this count out two seconds mm-hmm. before they're counted out fully. They mm-hmm. do translate. They sideways strafe towards deep six, mm-hmm. and I think at that point the ref needs to stop the count. See what happens. Mm-hmm. If they continue to move and take the fight to deep six, start the count again when they stop moving. If not, continue the count. It's ref's discretion. They're, it is yeah, they're, they're, ref's discretion. I mean, and ref's word is final. Um, yeah, I, don't, I don't remember um, what it looked like like in the pits for the, the actual live fight. Um, I will say, and I, I just I don't know if this is an example of that, but there have been instances in the past where the, ver- the, the the show as it's cut together is, yes. is not basically how it appeared when you were there live. Yeah, and very much so. I don't think that there's no intent to, no. I don't think there's any intent to stir up controversy or anything. They're just trying to create the TV show and mm-hmm. it's possible that it might look like some sort of blatant, uh, you know, unfairness, but yeah. on the ground, it was, it, it could have been a much clearer situation. I just, there I don't was... recall how this one went. I'm actually glad you brought that up because now you mention it, there was one very obvious jump cut where Deep Six and Shatter went to opposite corners mm-hmm. and then the next time you see Deep Six it's, it's right, right back up against yeah. um, Shatter again. So that's a lot of time in between them getting back up, driving out of that corner round the upper deck over to near Shatter. Um, I should... and again, they're not, I, I truly believe they're doing their best. They are not trying to bamboozle the fans no. or the or anything no 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 no. making a tv show is a complicated thing and sometimes the way that it ends up on tv um might look different than it did to people on the ground. absolutely and i should also stress as well i don't think the result of the fight was going to change i think deep six had had the fight sorted anyway it's just i found it a bit unusual but again you you may well be right it it may end up being you know a case of it's the way it was cut together whether it's a ko or a judge's decision deep six gets the win and i'm it shouldn't really matter because a win is a win. And mm-hmm. I, I, it brings up a, a point of contention for me with a lot of people that uh, a judge's decision win is deemed less good than a knockout win, which I don't think is the case at all. Because if you are dominating a match as Deep Six did in this fight, you're the clear winner of this judge's decision mm-hmm. uh, and you have deservedly won the fight. Yeah, in, in legal terms, we call it harmless error. If it was gonna, <laughs> even if it was an incorrect count out, it would have gone. It mm-hmm. would have had the same ultimate decision. It would not have changed the result. Correct, correct. It is a shame for Shatter. I think you know, as as a, as a big fanboy, it was it was very sad to see it go. I would have loved to have seen how they would have dealt with Ribot because you know both have got lots of configurations they could have gone with, and it was been a really interesting tactical fight. But Deep Six won out, and it was very very impressive. Again, you know, Dustin really you know gave Shatter a hard time and deservedly going through and what a what a way to do it as well like that yeah. you know, some spectacular hits and what a result what a coming out party for deep six honestly yeah. like it, it really it, it's it's just it's fun to see bot, a bot that's been there for a few years now finally have its time in the sun uh you know and we'll see in this upcoming fight if it actually gets a chance at lockjaw well that's a good segue and i have to say uh... the driving from dustin in this fight was exceptional like it was yes. so cagey and Someone David meant- Jin summed it up perfectly at the end of this fight, I think, by saying he never over rotated, he never under rotated, he was always there on us at every moment, and it made it incredibly difficult for them to execute their um, their game plan of taking out the wheels. Someone I, I saw a comment somewhere online, I can't remember where exactly, but basically they said it wasn't a good fight for TV, but like for people no. like us who like enjoy the sport and like. Are- Incredible driving match. I, I want to use the, the term purists here because I, 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 I suppose I suppose it's the closest thing I can think of. But like, I mean, look at we, us. We're we all can appreciate here. it. We have a know? podcast on a robot combat show. I know. I think we, this is as niche as it gets. <laughs> I suppose so. But like, we, we can appreciate you know an expertly executed strategy from both teams. And I think Ribot, you know, trying to get round and made the right choice with the undercutter. It was just a. It was the anticipation. Because yeah. you, you knew as soon as there was a connection, something big was going to happen, but you just didn't know what. And, and this fight could have gone really badly for Ribot. They got it stuck really against the could. wall. Yeah. yeah. It, it was, I mean, both lose a wheel and, and both continue to drive. 
Uh, it's, I think, where where we look at the comments saying having exposed wheels is is not a great idea in robot combats. Well, these two robots, one of them was driving on one wheel yeah. and still managing to engage with the opponent. The other was driving on three. It's it's baffling that they have that amount of uh, just just such good drive ability. They mm-hmm. they can keep control of their robot on one wheel, and that's it's really impressive. Mm-hmm. So how how do we feel if this whole fight goes with robot driving circles around Deep Six? Let's say in a hypothetical space. <laughs> If Ribot drives in circles and doesn't end up behind, I mean, this is really out there, but I'm just saying as a, a, as a rules analyst, so say, say, say if such a situation happens where Ribot does not find a way around Deep Six and Dustin just drives a perfect fight, who do you give this fight to? Really? You have to give it to Deep Six. I would give it to Deep Six because um, yeah. that's one thing, that's what bothered us. Uh, in it's it's 20, very tricky. In 2019, um, yeah. in our match against Extinguisher and Rainbow, we mm-hmm. think that we should have gotten that judge's decision because Rainbow did not engage at all. So um, did most other builders. Him the whole time. <laughs> and so, and normally, and the, the reps even told them during that match, like, you, you can't gotta go just in. run away, you will yeah. lose. Um, mm-hmm. Like, you're supposed to engage. And that's what Deep Six was trying to do the whole time. And I, I get mm-hmm. Ribot being the, the quicker, more maneuverable, and taking the defensive tack. But had they not actually engaged, but had run a perfect defensive match, they should lose. I if I could, if I could be Ribot's lawyer really quickly, I was so hard for me to tell whether it was an aggressive strategy or a defensive strategy it's because so they tricky. were trying to go in for the hit every time, mm-hmm. and like I wouldn't want to go at deep six straight ahead. So I'm a little bit torn on on how I would characterize their strategy. Oh my god! I they, like I this never fight. knew that this is what I needed oh in uh, in robot combat. Is <laughs> yeah. is after a judge's decision. <laughs> We then get a legal debate. We get litigation. Over, <laughs> over the decision. Oh, it would make it such a good reality show. <laughs> Bot um, trial. Fight court. <laughs> oh my god. It's all, I'll it's all do a pro bono. <laughs> <laughs> um I will say it's, it's a shame the way the fight ended for Deep Six with the wheel just mm-hmm. literally just coming off its its rim. Um they lined it up so Beautiful. I mean that that second wheel, the first wheel, they waited, they lined it up, they realigned, they went, eh, yeah, that's so the careful, Boop. so it was, careful. It was it, it was like at the deli counter. He just like, oh, how, how thick of a slice do you want? Yeah, <laughs> it was awesome. They did just enough to remove that first one, and then yeah, as you said, the the grip went. I, I am fascinated how Donald would have dealt with Deep Six. I'm, I'm sure we'll. We, we may never know. We may never know. Yeah. But uh, it, it would have been a, a fascinating fight nonetheless. But it is Ribot who um, makes its way through the bracket to fight mm. our bounty for the week, which is Lockjaw. Uh, ho-hum. This, this was a... It was almost sad. And I, yeah. I, I, I say that with the... We, we, we had Donald on last year, and, you know, we, we, we have the utmost respect for Donald and his abilities. And it, the thing that I... As soon as I saw the wedge at the back just get, you know, the two corners broken off, uh, he just knew it was curtains, sadly, after that point. And Ribot just took its time... Smash the wheels in, fight over. It's not a good year for Lockjaw. Oh, and four, yeah. I know. Crazy. Not a good year. It's oh, a it's a Bronco <sighs> season, unfortunately. You, you say that though. I mean, let's look at the robots it lost to. Copperhead got to the right. top sixteen. Hypershock Blip. as uh, Blip got to the top eight. Hypershock, as we've seen last week, destroying you know its opponents, yeah. and obviously Ribot as well. Number two seed. Yeah. It's tough. It's high caliber machines. And you, you don't think about them as being high caliber machines in that, you know, Blip was a rookie this year, but built by a veteran builder who got through to the top four last year. Uh, you've got Hypershock, who's always flattered to deceive, but as we've seen, is bodying everything at the minute. Um, Ribot, who's came onto the scene as a joke robot, and everyone went, oh, it's a joke robot, and then it beat mm. Endgame. And went, oh. <laughs> I wouldn't say joke, I, I'd say eye candy. <laughs> it's just, it was a gimmick. Oh, look, okay. he's got a frog on the top of it. Ha ha, funny uh, yeah. robot. Oh, oh, it's good. Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And, you know, these are the robots that are, it's like your uppercuts. It's the robots that are coming to the top of the pile now. They are the mm-hmm. new tombstones, the new broncos of the seasons, and this is it and you look past them because you have legends like lockjaw etc still fighting but you definitely shouldn't because they are the high caliber machines we have now mm-hmm. i wanted to say as well like i saw was it i want to say it was yourselves that posted a a picture of 
um, yourselves and Doddled from back in 2003, was that, was that yes, you guys? Yes, that's right. Um, how much would you have loved to have fought Lockjaw with Double Jeopardy? We would have loved to do it because uh, in that event, um, that was in the lightweight class, so 60 pounds. It was Bot Bash 2003. Um, mm -hmm. And we won second place uh, in that event to Donald's uh, propane. So sort of the tiny version of, of like the old version of Lockjaw that had the jaws in the front. Yeah. Um, and just the two-wheel drive and the lifter. Um, there's a new version by Kevin Lilly called Tastes Like Burning that's inspired by that one that currently fights in the, in the lightweight class. Um, and that was the only time that Troublemaker, our 60 pound robots ever been flipped out of the arena because that's what propane did to us um, a, a, in an earlier match and went on to win first place. Uh, so it would have been great to um, get a rematch there. The fun fact about that event too is for the second place finish, uh, we had to do a death match with Jason Bardis, uh, current judge with his 60 pound robot, Finferno, and we knocked them out of the arena. Um, so that was fun. But uh, Donald is a great competitor. You know, he's been in the sport for so long. He's an institution. Um, but I thought this fight was, I mean, I thought the, the whole tournament here was a really uh, great uh, showing for Ribot. And, you know, Ribot, it's, it's an undercutter and it's a vert. Um, so it's not groundbreaking in that sense. But what I think they've done really, really well, I think probably better than any other robot, they have dialed in the, the modular weaponry. Um, where they excelled in this short, you know, time frame of the tournament with both the undercutter um, and the vert, and I, I struggle to think of another robot that has dialed in the modular weaponry. I that think the well. the so, only one that sprung to mind when I was watching the episode was uh, Robot Wars Robot Tornado. Back in I the was day. just going to say it. Time, I was just going to say it. <laughs> Tornado did really well to dial it in, but they did tend to then favor the wedge. Um, yes. So, in that regard. Ribot, I feel, is is outclassing them in dialing in yeah. specific I was, weaponry. I was going to say tornado. The weapon was always not, not an afterthought, but like it was, it was a a, a wedge bot slash you know control bot in a sense where it, it was it would just keep hitting you until you broke. Whereas yeah. ribot, it will just hit you once with its weapon, and you know, and it, you will break exactly. <laughs> yeah, and that's what I love about ribot too is is they've taken right because every, every robot you have to strike the balance or pick pick which direction you want to go if you want it more offensive or more defensive and lately lockjaw has opted a little more towards the defensive side with their yeah. heavy plate and everything and they tend to approach people with that what i like about robot is they put more points into offense um they yeah. really have because their their front armor is is pretty substantial the rest of the robot really is not it is it is not as heavily armored as a lot of the other robots so they have really skewed towards offense and this was a great example, this tournament, of that paying off. Um, and of course, to succeed in that strategy, uh, you have to be able to drive the robot really well. And, and David Jin uh, proved that he's able to do that. Absolutely. Yeah, and uh, robot is just so dialed in this season. I mean, they beat Double Jeopardy. So come on. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I think you gave him the hardest time. He caused yeah. he he the most damage in this episode. So <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is genuinely true. Look, look at Deep Six. Couldn't take the frog head off, could it? So no. That's right. Um, <laughs> um, I, gonna... I did enjoy Go the uh, the the moment they gave to um, Donald to talk yes. about this new wave of robots coming in because they, they were right in saying he is not only a roboteer but he's a fan of the sport uh, as mm -hmm. a lot of us who who do this sort of thing are. Um, in fact, I'm Touching pretty nothing. sure everyone who, who's yeah. involved in the, in the sport. <laughs> I think we all started out fans. as fans, did we not? <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it was a, a truly wonderful moment, a lovely moment to to give. Him the time to do that and and to you know show show his respect for for Ribot and everything, um, yeah. Lockjaw struggled this season and mm -hmm. you know it felt very much like the Tombstone fight from 2018 where mm -hmm. the wheels got hit and that was curtains for Lockjaw. Yeah, I I, I hope that we see Donald come back again. I'm sure he will do, but mm -hmm. you know that it was like the way that the the whole episode was kind of frame i suppose if you like it was kind of like oh yeah you know this is getting towards the end of it but I, i'm sure he'll be back and kicking everyone's ass again as he as he has so often oh, yeah. done so many times over the course of battle bots and he's you know, been here for over 20 years he's not gonna stop <laughs> he's not no and you know the, the, the i'm sure the pits will be a better place for it mm. yeah. now i want to talk a little bit more about going forward with double jeopardy so yes. obviously We've, we've discussed, you know, a lot of the improvements that you've made to the robot going from, you know, 2018 to, to now. 
what can you kind of bring, what can you tell us at least that you're trying to bring to the table for the next version of Double Jeopardy? Sure. So as we do with every year, we're increasing the number of shots. I think our target for uh, this upcoming year is five shots. Yes. Um, so in, in the rib up fight, we had our three shots. Uh, definitely two of them got out. We're going to post like a video. We got to like go in there with a the super slow-mo to mm -hmm. show people where the second slug came out. It was in that first approach that Ribot had towards us. It was very yeah. Crazy. It, it, it kind of dribbled out. Something happened. Yeah. I, I think the third <laughs> slug dribbled out. The third slug right, dribbled yeah. out with the second one. But the second slug it hit the undercutter and took a chunk out. Of it. Nice. Um, so and and we have some. Uh, one of the photographers did get a good still shot of the of the um, second slug. One of the balls bouncing off of the <laughs> undercutter. Um, but we don't have that moment of impact. So again, we're going to go back to the footage and see if we can break it down. And, and really uh, identify um, where that second shot um, connected. Uh, so of course, for the future, we want more shots. Uh, so we're gonna, we're targeting at least five. We're gonna have to have a larger reloader to achieve that. And of mm -hmm. course, to have more weight for more shots, we need, a, we need to save weight somewhere. So we're actually pretty dramatically changing the profile of Double Jeopardy um, mm -hmm. to make it look cooler. Uh, right, because you got to make it look good for TV. Of course, so we're going to have the, the cannon will be completely exposed on the top, and so <laughs> it'll be basically the cannon sitting on a box that's a much smaller profile. So as you can, you know, see the old uh, size of Double Jeopardy was quite huge, um, yeah. and the new footprint of Double Jeopardy that we're working with is this. Um, so much smaller, much narrower, wow. uh, a lot shorter. This is this is enough to basically hold the cannon on it, um, and with the brushless drivetrain, we can have that nestled under the cannon safely because the motors are pretty small, um, and so it'll have a much smaller footprint, a much sleeker look, a uh, much stronger armor is what we're also going to be able to put on there. We want to be able to take hits from a robot um, like Ribot, uh, yeah. and so by having the smaller profile, we're able to reinvest that weight into the armor. We're going to have a camera on board again, of course. And then um, the more kind of technical upgrade that we want to make is we want to improve the control solution for the cannon itself. Because for every season so far, um, the way it's controlled is we literally just have it on a throttle on a radio that Bryce operates. And it's, you know, the, he can just hold open the throttle and the valve stays open, um, which is not great because it means that he's got to have like, lightning fingers like straight up and down timing just right to open the valve enough to clear the slug and close it quick enough to not let the other slug out and he did great in in this last season um but it's a pain in the butt it's hard to do in the heat of battle and so oh yeah absolutely you got enough on your mind as it is <laughs> exactly our, our new control solution so we're, we're putting together a, a special switch for it that will allow us to just use the same throttle stick on the radio but it'll hit a certain threshold and just turn on for a set amount of time, uh, enough to clear the slug, uh, close the valve, and save as much air pressure as we can, which will also enable us to have more shots, to be uh, a little more precise with how we use the pressure in our tank. And so improving that control solution to have a specified on time that's a more optimized on time than, a, than basically the manual control that we've had is really going to be what enables us to have uh, additional shots um, going forward. Okay. Um, question from the builder of uh, the Beetleweight Boom Zoom from the UK, uh, Rob, uh, has asked, would you ever consider doing another projectile weapon at a lower weight class? So obviously Nor Norwalk Havoc is obviously a thing, you know, would you, would you consider taking a, a featherweight up there? We've considered it, but there is no other competition anywhere in the entire world that allows it. Ever allow projectiles. Fair so. enough. So that... uh, there was a there was a brackets. Is it feasible? Yeah. Um, the answer is no. no. <laughs> yeah, and th that's it. Is it, 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 and it. It makes sense. There, there. It's it's tough. The the battle box is literally the best arena in combat robotics history. It is the strongest, best arena, and they're very cautious. They're very safety conscious, and so we do have a lot of limitations with double jeopardy. Take that robot wars. Um, <laughs> that we're able to do because they have such a great arena and no other event <laughs> be double jeopardy essentially you say we're, robot wars robot safely. i was gonna say interestingly i read somewhere on the robot wars wiki did you guys apply for robot wars at one point 
We did. Uh, so we first pitched Double Jeopardy for the 2016 season uh, mm. for BattleBots. And that was with an untethered projectile because it was the first time it had ever been allowed. And as I mentioned earlier, they said, no, we don't want you to kill a spectator. So we decided to go and apply for Robot Wars because Robot Wars did allow tethered projectiles. So mm. we <laughs> a tethered projectile version of Double Jeopardy, the single shot version. Um, and we were met with a similar concern about killing a spectator. Well, um, here's the thing. There was an other untethered projectile. It just wasn't planned. That's right. <laughs> I yeah. knew you were going to say it. Down, but I promise. knew you were going to say it. It's, it's, it's funny because I was thinking exactly the same thing. <laughs> um, yeah. No, Apex, Apex is one of the best uh, robot cocktails there are. So, yeah. well. Oh, that's a brilliant segue. That's a brilliant segue. So one of my many passions is obviously robot combat. Another one is alcohol. Um, <laughs> are we ever going to see from yourself, Evan, like a, a, a cocktail like menu or book or something? Because I, I, I need oh, we it. We got beers for BattleBots by yeah, the Witch Doctor team, but us adults need to book. I need it. <laughs> I oh, it's real? It. I need <laughs> it. Yeah, it's real. I, I printed off a couple of copies um, in, I think, 2018. Uh, oh, man. So, I don't think Random House will publish that, but, you know, you could try. Look, no, Amazon will publish anything. This is yeah. true. Now, I, I'm concerned about, like, you know, the trademark issues and everything, so I'd have to rewrite sure. it to be the non-branded, use white rum instead of, like, you know. Oh. Or, yeah. Honestly, no, what it, it would have to be rewritten. Whenever I see, like, obviously you post, you know, post them for every new robot and, you know, robots all the time. And I, whenever I see them, I'm like, oh my God, I, I could just, you know, I could, you know, lose a lot of days from seeing some of your cocktails, Evan. It's, it's yeah. very, they're awesome and, and please keep doing them. <laughs> the blend of mixology and robot combat, who knew? Exactly. Who knew? That's right. I gotta, I gotta do a retrograde, uh, I think, uh, coming up um, because uh, I don't have a drink for them yet. So I'm Ooh, something, to look forward, something to look forward to. Um, I think the last question I'm going to say is a, a comment we had, I think it was earlier today, is from a person called Violet Staveley, and they asked, um, would you ever consider using Double Jeopardy for vigilante justice? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a common that's a common thread that you yeah, get, course, right? Which robot do you want in the zombie apocalypse? And I honestly there you think go. Double Jeopardy, <laughs> assuming you have a steady supply of nitrogen, mm, would not nice. be a bad robot to have on your side. And, you know, running out of nitrogen, I don't know how well you'd be able to do if you pressured it up with, like, a bike pump, but no. you'd probably be able to take it <laughs> off uh, well, yeah. nitrogen's pretty common on this planet, so I think, I mean, it's, I mean, getting it in canisters, different problem, but, you know, it's, yeah. it's a thing. Oh, dear me. Um, guys, thank you very much for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you both, and um, I hope you come back next season and talk to us again, because this was, this was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks for having us. No yes, worries thank you so much. No worries at all. Um, with all that said, I have been Sam at 64. I am Steve the American Killjoy. I am World of Woodrow. And you've been listening to the Robocast. That, that, yes, we'll, we'll, we'll with go the with double that. jeopardy group. <laughs> way to finish. <laughs> we'll go with that. Um, well, thank you all for listening, and we'll see you next week for more BattleBots Champions reviews. We'll see you then. <laughs>